Hello, everyone. I'm Ann O'Connor. On behalf of my Baybridge co-founders, Jen Coop Olsta and Kathy Werzer, and our entire leadership team at Baybridge, I welcome you to the Spring 2022 Whitefish Bay Candidate Forum. Thank you to the Whitefish Bay Public Library for providing this virtual platform. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for moderating again this year. And thank you to our six candidates for being willing to serve our community and for their willingness to engage in the, the forum this evening. And thanks to you, the residents and constituents for taking part in this democratic process. A little bit about Baybridge. Baybridge was founded in Whitefish Bay in 2019 and has a vision of making Whitefish Bay more welcoming to all. More information about our organization can be found at baybridgewisconsin.org and on our Baybridge Wisconsin Facebook and Instagram pages. We invite you to join us at our upcoming next event on April 27th, 7 p.m. at Christ Church Episcopal, as we, along with two dozen other co-sponsors, welcome the UWM team of Ann Bonds, Derek Hanley, Reggie Jackson, and Lawrence Hoffman to present on their very important research project, Mapping Racism and Resistance in Milwaukee County, Struggles Over Racism in the Urban North. The project addresses restrictive covenants in our region and includes restrictive covenants here in Whitefish Bay. Again, more information can be found on our website, baybridgewisconsin.org, and there will be virtual and in-person options for that event. We also encourage you to sign up for our newsletter on our website that would allow you to keep informed of all our upcoming events and volunteer opportunities. Now for a few points about tonight's forum. Questions presented to the candidates came from you, the residents of Whitefish Bay. A request for questions was circulated by multiple avenues, including the weekly email newsletter of the Village of Whitefish Bay, the newsletter of the Whitefish Bay Business Improvement District, Bay Bridges monthly newsletter, the Facebook pages, Villagers of Whitefish Bay, Parents of Whitefish Bay, and Bay Bridge, and the Whitefish Bay Patch News Service. During the forum, you may wish to change your view settings to focus on the speaker. If you put it on a uh, view speaker setting, that will center each candidate as they respond to questions and provide their opening and closing remarks. We also invite you to participate in a survey that will be made available at the end of the forum. We encourage you to find ballot and voting information for the April 5th, 2022 spring election on the website at vote 411.org and myvote.wi.gov. A recording of tonight's forum will be made available at baybridgewisconsin.org and on the Baybridge YouTube page. Thank you everyone for joining us. And I'd like to now introduce League of Women Voters Forum moderator, Julie Bowles. Welcome, Julie. Thank you, Anne. Welcome to the candidate forum for Whitefish Bay Village Board and School Board. Thank you to our sponsor, Bay Bridge, and many thanks to the Whitefish, uh, Whitefish Bay Public Library for providing our virtual platform. My name is Julie Bowles, and I will be your forum moderator this evening. We will start with the Village Board Forum and then proceed to the School Board Forum at about 8 o'clock, finishing at about 9 o'clock. The League of Women Voters of Milwaukee County is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization that promotes informed and active participation in government. As a nonpartisan group, the League never endorses a political party or candidate. It is important to be an educated voter, so we thank you for taking the time to learn about the candidates. We also welcome you to join the League of Women Voters, which despite its name also includes men as members. Questions for this candidate forum event were submitted prior to the forum by voters in the Whitefish Bay community. Thank you to everyone who provided questions. We had numerous submissions, unfortunately too many to present in the time allotted for the forum. So where possible, we've tried to combine the questions so we can cover as many topics as possible. So three candidates are seeking election for Whitefish Bay Village Board vying for two positions. On the ballot are 
Jay Balachandran, Anna Casper, and William Olson. One additional name that will appear on your ballot is Timothy Pusnansky. He has withdrawn from the race to avoid a conflict of interest with his position on the Milwaukee County Board of Election Commissioners. The candidates have chosen to be addressed by their first names. We will begin with two minute opening statements from each candidate, followed by the questions with 90 seconds allowed for each answer. Then we will end with 60 second closing remarks. Lots were drawn to determine the order of speaking. The order of first response to a question will rotate among the candidates. Um, candidates, you will see a sign indicating when you have 30 seconds left to speak, 15 seconds left to speak, and when you must stop. Please honor the guidelines for the forum so that we may make the best use of our time in this forum opportunity. All right, so let's begin with opening statements. Uh, in two minutes or less, please share your opening comments. We will begin with Will Olson. All righty, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, first off, I guess I just wanted to say thank you to our hosts. Um, I know you just heard a little bit about them, but the League of Women Voters in Baybridge are both fantastic uh, organizations. And if, if you're not familiar with them, please do read up on them afterwards and consider supporting them. They do really important work. Um, Second, just thank you to all of you for coming out tonight. You know, municipal elections don't often get a lot of attention. Um, and I think it's because municipal government usually isn't that exciting. And when it is exciting, it's usually because something uh, horribly bad has happened and people's basements are full of water or things like that. But in between those moments, there's really important work that happens. Um, you know, our, our village board sets policy for zoning they set the standards by which uh, our small business you know, community operates. They choose to make infrastructure investments or to choose not to make investments depending on the situation. Uh, they make a lot of really important public safety decisions as well. So it's, it's really important work that doesn't get a lot of attention. But that's actually sort of what drew me to wanting to run for the position in the first place because I, really care about having a proactive energetic board that is working on the big issues um, because they take time and they're not easy and they don't always get the kind of public support and attention we'd like, but they're incredibly important for determining what our community becomes. And so uh, I chose to run for village board to bring a proactive energetic approach to those big issues um, with the hope that we can leave Whitefish Bay a better place than we found it so that the next generation inherits a community that is an even better experience than the one we have today. So I look forward to talking more about some of the issues and thank you so much for uh, coming tonight. Great, thank you. So Jay, we'll move to you next. I'm muted, classic <laughs> Zoom 101. Uh, I want to echo Will in uh, thanking everyone for making time tonight and for the League of Women Voters, Bay Bridge, and the library for putting on the event. I was chatting recently with a person of color who lives in Whitefish Bay, and she told me that her initial experience as a resident was terrible, how the neighbors in her apartment building would call the police on her for no reason, sometimes even trumping up domestic disturbance complaints, even when no one was home. But she persevered, she bought a home in the village, and today she loves Whitefish Bay. She loves her neighbors, she loves her neighborhood. That story, I think, encapsulates our village in a lot of ways. It's a place I'm proud to call home. It's a place that has schools, festivals, and amenities that most other communities could only dream of. People can be warm, welcoming, but at the same time, we know the village can sometimes feel a bit insular and people without the means or the patience to make their way and stay here might be tempted to give up. It's a great place to live that could also do better in some ways. And I think her story also encapsulates the dual responsibilities of village government. As one of the current trustees told me, never forget that most people just want functioning sewers, clean streets and general safety. And in that sense, the village does a phenomenal job. And certainly as a trustee, part of my role would be to continue that stewardship not just for the utilities and safety, but for the support of our wonderful schools, parks, and library. But I think it's equally critical for public servants to be open to what we could do better, to develop an inclusive and aspirational vision 
and to strategize how to achieve that vision. And in the forum tonight, I hope you'll learn about the skills and perspective that I'll bring to the Village Board to work with you, the community, and the village leadership to bring those visions to actuality. Thank you. Thank you. And Anna, your opening statement, please. Hello, everyone. I'm super excited to be here tonight. Thank you for caring about your local government and attending this year's forum. Also, thanks to Bay Bridge and the League of Women Voters. My name is Anna Casper, and right off the bat, I'll give you my contact info. My Facebook page is facebook.com backslash vote Anna Casper, and that's Casper with a K. My website is www.voteannacasper.com, and we'll go live after tonight's forum. Feel free to contact me through there. I'm running my campaign with open communication, so please feel free to reach out. This is an attitude I will continue if elected. I want all my neighbors, and I think you're all neighbors, to feel free to contact me if they have any problems because I want to be your connection to Village Hall. Some quick background information about myself. I've lived in Whitefish Bay for over nine years and I absolutely love it here. I've been a small business owner for over a decade and I'm the only one running with that background. I think this makes me the candidate who can handle the issues of Silver Spring Drive. I'm also excited that if I'm elected, Whitefish Bay will have three male trustees and three female trustees making the representation equal. Many municipalities around the country are not that progressive yet, but I think Whitefish Bay can do it. As I said before, thank you for taking the time to be here tonight and feel free to contact me. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, let's see. All right, now we will move to the questions submitted from the Whitefish Bay community. Uh, again, sign will let you know when you have 30 seconds, 15 seconds remaining, and when you must stop. We'll begin with Jay. And the first question is, as village trustee, what approaches would you use to meet, get to know, and learn from residents? It's a great question. I think in order to know what's happening in the community, you have to engage with the community. That involves creating and maintaining partnerships with residents and various community groups. It could also entail for specific issues, creating community forums, focus groups, listening sessions, or surveys. But then you've got to determine if the issues you're hearing about constitute a problem. You've got to find out, are those things occurring frequently? Have they been lasting for a while? Are they affecting a lot of people? Is it disrupting personal or community life? Is it impacting access to basic rights? Is there a perception that it's a problem? You've got to study what forces support changing that issue or which ones impede changing that issue. And then you've got to identify what needs to change to solve the problem. And that requires a root cause analysis. And as Anna has well said on this issue, I think a big part of this is going to be open communication keeping myself uh, engaged with many different groups, not just ones that I personally uh, uh, have affinity for, but ones that I may not necessarily agree with. I think having a broad awareness of those issues is critical. And I think in addition to the community, understanding what's come before us, so I'm speaking with former leadership and understanding what the business leaders and civic leaders think are also key pieces of this. So broad engagement. Thank you. Uh, so next to Anna, what approaches would you use to meet, get to know, and learn from residents? I couldn't agree with Jay Moore. I think engagement is key. Um, communication, connection, teamwork are key. Um, and I think great work is done when a mix of resident communication and gaining knowledge from village experts, experts and leadership groups is, is key too. Um, and I think teamwork is the fast track to village success. So I think that means being out in the community and actually showing up. Um, I know someone who is on the board who lives on my block and I think he's only been to maybe one block party in the last nine years. Um, so I think you have to be there. You have to be active. You have to be in the Facebook villagers group. You have to just be someone where people are like, hey, I have something to tell you. Can we talk about this? Um, for example, 
my sidewalks on my block were really awful. People kept hurting themselves. And the more we talked about it, I finally just reached out to DPW and they're fixed now. So I think just being someone where people can just contact you, that's key. And just being open and welcoming. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Will. Well, I definitely echo everything that uh, Jay and Anna said. I think being being open is key. I, I also think there's a degree of um, a proactive approach that's really helpful. Um, I have a background in community organizing, and I think it's really important to meet people where they are, because then that's how you get to the issues and the problems and the opportunities that you don't even know existed. Um, you know, I've been doing some door-to-door -door canvassing and talking to people, and that's how I discovered issues that I don't think I ever would have heard of. And you know they might seem small to some people, but they're big to the person you're talking to. And that's really what matters. And so I think being proactive, getting out there, whether we're talking about community events, like Anna mentioned, the block parties, um, you know, all of our great civic foundation events that happen throughout the year, but also just, you know, if you know there's an area that's gonna be particularly affected by an issue, going door to door in the area, talking to people, listening, and, and, and making that effort, because I think that really matters. And it makes people feel like they're involved in their village government, which I also think is really important. So I would echo everything about being involved with community groups and being open to all forms of communication. And also just say that um, getting out there and meeting people where they are is really helpful. Great, thank you. Uh, so now we'll have question two and we'll start this time with Anna. So many Whitefish Bay residents view Shorewood's Oakland Avenue as a model for Silver Spring Drive. What will it take to build Silver Spring to a similar position of strength? And what do you view as realistic goals for the next few years? Thank you. Um, I'm super excited about this question because um, as a small business owner, um, I have my own business. I don't have a business on Silver Spring, but I still feel like I'm in the head of someone who's thinking about opening a business on Silver Spring. Um, this is really exciting for me to think about. Um, <clears throat> so I've already been attending uh, business improvement district meetings, uh, CDA meetings, and I have talked with landlords and business owners. So um, I feel like I'm ready to tackle this question. Um, the bid has a really great strategic plan and I plan on working with that. Um, CDA is working with Grafe, um, and I think they're going to do a great job. Um, I also think that hiring an economic development director might be an exciting thing to think about. Um, a lot of people don't know that we have grant money for people who want to open a small business here on Silver Spring. So I think there needs to be an awareness campaign about that. Um, and I think a lot of people don't know that the average group of people spends just a little bit over 15 minutes um, shopping here. <laughs> so I think maybe taking out the parking meters is something we can look into. Um, there's just a lot we can do. And I think collaborating collaborating and working together um, and just being active in all parts of that um, will really lead us forward. Great, thank you. Uh, will, so uh, many Whitefish Bay residents view Shorewood's Oakland Drive, Oakland Avenue as the model for Silver Spring Drive. What will it take to build Silver Spring to a similar position of strength? And what do you view as realistic goals for the next few years? Yeah, I think uh, uh, you know our best bet, legally questionable, is to use the zoning code to mandate that every bank starts serving food as well. Um, <laughs> pretty sure we can't do that. So uh, I think part of what makes Oakland work is that it was ambitious. Um, it didn't settle for a uh, structure that was built for a different era of commerce. And it uses mixed use development with commercial and residential space to create an income stream for landowners um, that is sustainable. And it lets them take a chance on things like restaurants or, or other businesses that might not be as successful or, or not have as uh, guaranteed of an income stream as something like a bank or a dentist's office. So 
I think we need to work within the strategic plans that we come up with, but I think we should be bold. I think status quo has gotten us to where we are and it's not a terrible uh, uh, space, but I do think it could be a lot better. And I just think that we should be ambitious and thoughtful about how we do it because if we are able to bring in mixed use development, we could also bring in significantly more housing to the village and significantly more affordable housing options. And it would just create a much more vibrant um, and commercially viable Silver Spring Drive. So the uh, strategic plan is great, but I just want us to be ambitious with it and not settle for the status quo. Great, thank you. Um, Jay, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I think I've got it, thanks partly because it's the number one issue that I think most people are asking about these days. Um, you know, I've had a chance to speak with business owners, landlords, and village officials about this issue as well, and it's certainly one that's important to me. I think um, we all look at Shorewood, um, but there are, I think, some unique pieces about Silver Spring that make it different. Of course, it's a lot shorter if you compare the length of Oakland and Capitol and Shorewood to the seven or eight blocks that we have. Anna mentioned the parking limitations that we've got. Um, we've got a number of properties there that are old enough that bringing them up to code for bars or restaurants could be cost prohibitive. And then, of course, there's the fact that these many of these buildings are private, well, they're all privately owned. So there's a, a limit to what we can do. But we have some great strengths, too. I mean, we are we have residents hungry to support great new businesses. Just look at how Moxie and Donut Monster are doing. And we have great foot traffic. I, I agree with Anna. They could be spending more time. Uh, at each store, but did you know that the Starbucks on Silver Spring is the single highest trafficked non drive through location for Starbucks in the whole state? So huge potential. I think the village is already doing some great things, as you, as Anna mentioned, having uh, Grave Consulting work with the CDA is great. The Business Improvement District does have uh, an incentive grant, uh, actually one of the best in the corner of the state. We just need to get the word out about it. But I think the vision needs to be there and we do have to be bold. And I guess if I had to say one thing, I would say no more banks, and I'll promise that. <laughs> Thank you. So now we'll move on to question three, and we'll start with Will. What capital projects would you like to see inserted into next year's budget? The capital budget is really the only significant place trustees can have a say in the budgeting process. Yeah, and I've, um, I've been attending some of the village board meetings going back months now, and I attended the budget meetings, which was fascinating. I strongly encourage anyone who's interested in um, what the village prioritizes to, to sit through a budget meeting, because then you see where we spend our money. Um, there are a number of capital projects. Uh, I tend to think of those in terms of some green infrastructure improvements that we could be working on, um, particularly because those are the kind of things that are good for the environment and they save us money. And you so rarely get opportunities like that. The, the solar panels on the public works building, those save us tens of thousands of dollars a year, right? And so expanding programs like that, working on flood mitigation projects, which again, they take time, they take startup investment, but the long run impact for the community is huge uh, in terms of cost savings and our impact on the environment. So I would like to see a more comprehensive and thoughtful approach to green infrastructure investments um, as opposed to the somewhat piecemeal approach that we've taken in the past. And, you know, we have this window with some of the uh, ARPA funds that have come down from the uh, recent federal um, uh, uh, bills. And so I would like to see us, again, be creative and thoughtful with how we use that and uh, prioritize green infrastructure. Great, thank you. Uh, so next we'll move to Jay. What capital projects would you like to see inserted into next year's budget? Yeah, I, um, it's a good question because um, as Will said, we've got a, a unique opportunity here with ARPA funds available. Uh, and to be honest, the village is so well managed that we tend to operate with a surplus and have a lot of opportunity here. I think there's uh, a lot of different places it could go, but I tend to also have sort of a green heart, if you will, and have wondered how we could expand um, some of our green initiatives, which we'll hopefully have a chance to talk about more. But certainly as Will sort of echoed a little bit of what, what I would say in this matter, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, rather than knowing a priori, 
exactly what I would spend money on. I think the approach is this. Uh, if we've got a, an opportunity to have a surplus, we should be engaging with our various community organizations to find out what they think the best use of this money is. Uh, you know, um, engaging, as Will said, going meeting them at their door and finding out um, what the lived experience is for different blocks that we don't necessarily engage with, uh, and find out if there's a way to bring um, bring some of those less less vocal groups into the fold or or represented in in some of the ways we use the money. So. I think um, great opportunity for us to reach out to the community and, and um, get information about, about how best to spend it. Great, thank you. And Anna. Um, I think I completely agree with Will and Jay. Um, I really agree with what Jay just said about meeting people where, they're, where they are and connecting and talking. And that's something I really want to just interview everyone about first and then make decisions. Um, talk to the library, talk to the police station, talk to you know the garden club, places like that and see what is on everyone's mind and maybe we can collaborate and make something really, really benefit everyone. Um, but yeah, the ARPA funds are, it's a really big thing and um, you know, green infrastructure is important and there's a lot we can do. So I think connecting first and then a decision. Thanks. Great, thank you. So next question, we'll start with Jay. And that question is, are there any specific environmental initiatives that you plan to support? Why or why not? Well, I'm glad to see that the village has taken steps to be more environmentally conscious not just the DPW solar panels, but the LED lighting. And I think certainly the village leadership has done a great job making those things happen, but I think we have to give some credit to the community members like Lane Kistler, Bruce Kruger, and Mimi Herrick, who have tirelessly championed these green initiatives. And I think honestly, rather than a specific initiative, my biggest contribution as, as a village trustee in this arena would be to see if we can reestablish a process or a committee for vetting initiatives or at least ensuring that decisions that the village makes are in alignment with our vision of the village as a champion for uh, environmentalism. You know, I think that could make our village more proactive rather than reactive with green initiatives and may us, make us less reliant uh, on individual community members. Um, I think that if we were to talk about specifics, expanding solar use, cultivating native species to uh, reduce lake runoff and flooding risk, and promote pollinator insect species. I personally, as a parent, would love to see a cross collaboration with the school district and the library to engage young people on thinking green. Great, thank you. Uh, next to Anna, are there any specific environmental initiatives you plan to support? Why or why not? Um, I'm really excited about composting and I talked with the garden club with it. I talked with DPW about it, um, but I would really like to see um, a village subsidy for a compost program um, because that can really reduce methane gas in our landfills. Um, I also think when redevelopment happens, thinking about green roofs and other efforts and sustainability like they did at Beaumont, um, that's a really great thing to do. Um, awareness of things at home, like stormwater utility credits, rain barrels, um, letting people know they can have an extra recycling bin, things like that. Um, and one idea I had, I don't know if it can happen, but maybe installing electric um, charging stations for cars, that would be kind of cool too. So, yeah. All right, thanks. And Will. Yeah, I love that we're getting to talk about this so much because I, I think it's one of the most exciting things that we can work on um, and that we just have so much control locally. So uh, I would definitely echo what's been said about the benefit of having an environmental standing committee in the village so that our village government is constantly considering with whatever we do, what is the environmental impact so that we're being, as Jay said, proactive as opposed to reactive. I, I think that is just so beneficial. And there are lots of specific programs I would like to support. Um, you know, solar panels save us money and they're good for the planet. They should be on every government building we have. 
Um, the programs like the LED street lights that reduce our power use, uh, energy efficiency improvements to buildings are pretty massive in Wisconsin because it is frigid for many months. And so reducing our heating use is incredibly beneficial. Uh, as Anna said, uh, stormwater diversion through, through rain barrels or, or rain gardens can have a huge impact, especially because you know, we're a community along one of the most beautiful lakes in the whole world, I think, and we should be taking care of it. Um, my biggest specific thing would be a pretty comprehensive rethinking of how we do waste management. Uh, the landfill we use was supposed to close in 2020, and we send far too many tainted loads of recycling to the recycling center. I think we need a comprehensive rethink, and I think we need to stop spending so much money throwing trash in a landfill where, as Anna said, it just generates methane gas and pollutes our environment. All right, thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to the next question, and this one we'll start with Anna. What are your views on allowing higher density housing and more small business zoning uh, as ways to make living here more affordable for more people? Um, well, I think anything that brings business to the community is great um, in housing and affordable housing. Um, I'm just trying to think where it would go. <laughs> We're very used up here, um, but Silver Spring, if, if it can be built up, that would be great. If Henry Clay can be looked at um, as a place to do those things, I think that would be great. Um, it, yeah, anything that benefits the community and we can work together and figure it out, I, I'm for it. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Will, what are your views on allowing higher density housing and more small business zoning as ways to make living here more affordable for more people? Uh, I would absolutely support that. I think that one of the issues, one of the long term issues that uh, I talk about a lot with people is our um, property values, right? So the average house in Whitefish Bay 10 years ago sold for around $300,000. Now it's $500,000. You know, th this used to be a community where working class, middle class families could afford to live here. And if we don't do what we can, you know, it's good that people want to move here. It's good that property values go up. I don't think anyone who owns a home is going to complain about that. But if we're not careful, we're going to become a community where only the wealthy can live. And this happens places. And the kids who grew up in those communities struggle to be able to move there. And it becomes a very strange place where you don't have the, the kind of socioeconomic diversity that I think we all value. So I would absolutely support more uh, zoning for more density, whether that's above buildings on Silver Spring, like I mentioned earlier with the mixed use development, or it is allowing more duplexes because we have a lot of big houses that could uh, house some grandparents who wanted to be near their grandkids maybe. Um, but I, I just think there's a lot of ways to do it without uh, changing the character of the community and, and but also with making it a much more accessible community for people to move to. And that's not only a, um, a good thing for uh, our property uh, taxes, but it's also a really important equity issue because if we're pricing people out, we are gonna keep um, a, a very not diverse village uh, on the same track. And that would just be such a shame. Thank you. And last to Jay. Um, yeah, the median monthly mortgage in Whitefish Bay is like 60% higher in the village than it is in the county and the state. And the median rent in the village is 40% higher in the village than in the county and the state. So for young families looking to bring their kids to our school district, this is a huge barrier to entry. And it's also time to change that stereotype that I think a lot of people have about affordable housing or mixed unit housing. The fact is an increasing number of people, regardless of financial or racial backgrounds, have high housing cost burdens. And when we create mixed income housing that allows for diversity, we're meeting everyone's needs and we have positive benefits above and beyond just providing that housing to the community, to the school district, to commerce. The problem we face is, as we've talked about, all the available land in the village has been used. We've got a ton of zoning for single family homes. Uh, and to compound that, there's that trend lately of flipping houses, which is great for property value, but terrible for affordability. Village leadership is well aware of this, and I'm speaking with current and former community leaders, I know that the main opportunity we've got is, as has been said, redeveloping our existing spaces. 
This is going to take a strong stance on the part of the village to engage with developers who have that shared vision of fair, affordable housing. And there are other municipalities who have implemented these sorts of things without eroding the character of the communities, which is important to us. So we can certainly leverage that shared experience. Great, thank you. Moving on to the next question. This one will start with Will. What are your views on exploring initiatives that support a trained non-police response to some situations that police often deal with? Examples are mental illness and wellness checks. Uh, I would absolutely support that. I have a friend, a good friend of mine um, in college. Uh, I went to University of Oregon, go Ducks. Um, and we had a service there called Cahoots, which was an emergency medical response team that was uh, trained with crisis management for people undergoing mental health episodes. And I'm quite confident that being able to call cahoots was, was what changed um, the course of my friend's life. There are just situations where the person who's responding needs to be trained with what to do when they get there. And it's not fair to ask our local police force to be trained in every possible eventuality. There are also a lot of situations that are not benefited by someone responding armed with lethal force. And so when someone is having a mental episode or a break of some kind, I think we absolutely should have a group that is specialized in responding with compassion and care and, and being able to handle and de-escalate situations like that. Because thankfully we haven't had any tragedies, but we are not a community that is immune from that kind of um, event from happening. It's, it's a percentages game. And I don't think any of us want that to happen, uh, least of all our police force. So I think we should try to take that off of their um, agenda, so to speak. And I think we should have people who are specifically trained in nonviolent crisis management when that is what our situations call for. Thank you. Uh, Jay, what are your views on exploring initiatives that support a trained non-police response to some situations that police often deal with? Examples are mental illness and wellness checks. Yeah, I think it's a phenomenal idea. You know, the, um, the, the concept here is that we want to think of police uh, as more uh, community guardians than, than militarized forces. And um, I think particularly for people of color for whom interactions with police can be invariably and disproportionately negative uh, in those cases, um, it, it may be helpful to, to, to think about expanding how police deliver their services um, in, in more of a community guardian standpoint. But I know that Chief Whitaker is very attuned to this. And I know that he's taken a lot of proactive stances to, to make sure that his staff are are doing the best they can to address um, address the needs of the community without necessarily bringing lethal force or um, you know a, a warrior mentality, so to speak. That dichotomy, of course, that we talk about sometimes between police as guardians versus warriors. Um, of course, when it comes to mental health, um, there's a huge need for non-police resources, uh, and I support any way the village could look to that for our particular community. I know that the county in general struggles with that issue and, and those issues have been well documented. But um, I think to get back to this uh, idea of, of police getting involved in issues that don't necessarily require uh, a cop, um, you know, T Chief Whitaker was just telling me the other day about having get, gotten called to get bats out of someone's attic. I don't know that you need to bring a revolver to that, um, but they're great partners for us. So uh, I hope that dialogue will continue. Thank you. And finally, Anna. I completely agree with Jay. Um, I actually sat down and had a meeting with the uh, police chief and um, we actually have some of this already implemented. Um, our officers have de-escalation training and they have continuing education. Um, they also have crisis intervention team programs done by the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, also, if necessary, our police department has access to social workers from other departments, like from Milwaukee. Um, and as a woman, I'm proud that we use the lethality assessment program, which protects women from abusive partners. Um, so I actually think a lot of this is already implemented and a lot of people are unaware. 
Thank you. So moving on to the next question, we'll start with Jay this time. As you consider your role as an elected official for the next few years, what is the one issue or concern that keeps you up at night and will demand your attention and energy from day one? What is your planned approach to addressing it if you are elected? Hmm. Well, let me start with an anecdote, uh, maybe to answer that question. When my wife and I hosted some backyard conversations um, about race and identity following the uh, events in 2020, we noticed this interesting phenomenon in people. People were hungering for a connection. And I think partly because of the pandemic and maybe the polarization of the politics, we've sort of just all become a little isolated in our social media bubbles. And once people started to connect during these get togethers, we noticed that once people got past, you know, the getting to know each other phase, we saw these organic conversations pop up about really contentious issues, things like the notion of police reform and racism. And the amazing thing was that at the same time that vitriol was bubbling up in social media and in the news about these topics, the conversations we saw were thoughtful, authentic, and polite. These were conversations between neighbors and not labels. Part of the reason I'm running for the village board is to restore that sense of human kindness and community. I, I think people are craving that. And rather than a particular policy or agenda, I think this notion of returning to that civility and authentic dialogue is, is a great ambition for our village. Uh, I've committed enough to this process that I've participated with some of you in the Braver Angels Depolarizing Within workshop. And I hope to take some of that training to our community dialogues and to Village Hall as well. Thank you. Uh, next to Anna, as you consider your role as an elected official for the next few years, what is the one issue or concern that keeps you up at night and will demand your energy and attention from day one? What is your planned approach to addressing it? Let's say that one issue is making our downtown um, much better. It's great, but I think if we want to keep residents here and make this a place that, you know, people move here for the schools and, and Lake Michigan, they also need to have a movie theater and a place to have brunch and a place to meet friends at night. And there needs to be things going on and, and, and a nightlife and a daytime life and people need to go shopping for Christmas presents and it needs to, be this place where you really, really want to be. We need to have more events. And to make that happen, I'll, like I said before, work with CDA and the bid and, and really make sure those things happen. Um, we have a TID um, that is worth like over a million dollars that needs to be used to, you know, making sure that that's used correctly and to the best benefit of everyone and just hit the ground running, make it happen, stay in connection with with residents and, and leadership groups. Thanks. Thank you. And Will. I think um, there, I mean, there are a lot of issues I care about, but I think the ones that worry me the most and that I would want to start working on the soonest are the ones where there's not the most community support. Um, there are a lot of things that I think a lot of people get behind, which is good. And those are not any less important, but I do think uh, some of the topics we talked about earlier, particularly housing affordability and some of the broader infrastructure challenges we're going to face. You know, this is a community that is well over 100 years old, and uh, uh, some of that sometimes shows up in uh, not so great ways. But those are also tend to be expensive or difficult projects, um, you know, in terms of long term infrastructure but also in terms of changing what people's expectations might be about a community that is very old. You know, we, we talked about affordable housing and it's true that the vast majority of this village is zoned for larger, more expensive single family homes. And that is what a lot of people are used to and any change can be scary. And I, I understand that it is gonna take time and effort to bring people along. And I wanna start working on that right away because I wanna make sure that Whitefish Bay is a great community that everyone can access and not just wealthy folks. And I think that's gonna be a challenge, but it's something I think we should start working on and start working on soon. Thank you. The next question we'll start with Anna. Inflation is at a 40 year high. 
What impact will inflation have on village finances or property taxes? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I guess we'll have to see how things are invested, how redevelopment works, um, how our budgets work, um, and how we use our money that is in funds like the tax in incremental district and, and how we reinvest things <clears throat> at certain times to make things benefit um, Silver mm -hmm. Spring and other areas around Whitefish Bay. Um, I guess it's just using our budget wisely and making good decisions at the right time. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Next to Will. Uh, inflation is at a 40 year high. What impact will inflation have on village finances or property taxes? I think it'll have a really big impact. Um, you know, some of our biggest expenses uh, from our, our annual budget are our wages that we pay our village employees who are the backbone of everything we do. They're the reason trash gets picked up. Uh, they're the reason that, you know, our community is, is what it is. And we need to be able to give them raises eventually if inflation continues so that they are able to maintain a standard of living. Uh, materials prices for infrastructure are only gonna go up. That's one of the reasons I think we should, we should start early and be ambitious about infrastructure because that's not gonna get any cheaper as time goes on. Um, you know, it's gonna have a huge impact and some of it is beyond our control, but some of it is within our control. And that's why I wanna focus on projects that can save us money in other places. You know, the solar panels that we mentioned earlier, those save us $60,000 a year. That's money that we can use to make sure that our village employees don't try to go somewhere else to get a raise. Um, projects like that are gonna be absolutely key and being creative and thoughtful and imaginative uh, uh, in a good way with what we do with our budget um, and our spending to make sure that we're sort of pinching every penny because I do worry about making sure we are a competitive hiring destination for all of our fantastic village staff and being able to afford basic materials prices for important infrastructure projects that happen every year from roads to sidewalks to sewers. We're gonna to have to pay for it one way or another. Thank you. And last to Jay. I think that uh, this is a question I'm glad I came last for. <laughs> no, to be totally um, honest though, I think there are gonna be some significant uh, significant changes to the expenditures for the for the for the bay and and those include as will said uh, most importantly staffing costs um, you know the the good news for us is that uh, we've had great leadership financially um, over several different administrations as it relates uh, to finances and so we're in a great position I mean I think that's part of the reason our property taxes although high to be honest, Per 100, uh, we have one of the lower uh, property tax rates when adjusted. So we've been able to keep those flat in part because of how well things have been managed. Um, I can't claim to know, you know, as an outsider, what the uh, nitty gritty is of the finances, but I certainly uh, have no, um, no doubt that this is going to take some rethinking of how expenditures are, um, are considered. So um, I'm ready to get to work for that and, and, and make sure that when we do have to make those tough choices that we're not sacrificing on uh, some of the uh, key priorities that we have. You know, we can certainly pinch during difficult times, but that shouldn't make us take our eyes away from the big strategy and the aspirational vision that we have for the village. So that's really where I would, um, where I would go with this. Great, thank you. And I think we have time for one last question and we'll start with Will. What is your position on consolidation of services with neighboring communities? For example, consolidation of police services. What monetary and non-monetary factors should be considered in these decisions? Well, I'd say first off that I think North Shore Fire has been an excellent proof point that you know, this can work and it can work really well. Um, we're a bunch of small communities with a lot of shared characteristics and we're all very close to each other. So it makes sense to share some of these resources. Um, how the nitty gritty of that works is really where the rubber meets the road on that, I think, otherwise great idea. Uh, I know that the uh, Glendale has been uh, in the process of working on a study to look at the impacts of this. And I think we should absolutely participate in that kind of analysis and review. 
I would say one thing that that does give me um, some pause if around consolidation of police forces is that I know that our police force has uh, put in place some fantastic measures and I would like to be able to build on that success. And the one issue with consolidation of police forces is that it does take away some local control such that if we wanted to implement new measures, uh, we might have to work within the boundaries of that broader shared network. So I think that would be something to consider. And I think it requires meeting with all the heads of the local municipalities, obviously including our police force. And like I mentioned earlier, getting out and talking to community members and, and finding out what people actually think about this, not just what the loudest two people in a Facebook comment section think, because uh, that is rarely representative. So absolutely worth consideration. And I think we should look into what the practical impact would be. Thank you. Jay, what is your position on consolidation of services with neighboring communities? What monetary and non-monetary factors should be considered in these decisions? Well, as you know, uh, consolidation of some services has been successfully done with other things like the North Shore Health Department and the North Shore Fire Department. Um, and there are hard to deny uh, financial benefits to communities that do this. I mean, Whitefish Bay currently spends over 40% of its budget on police, usually police being the highest uh, single expenditure for most municipalities. The Wisconsin Policy Forum estimated that when the North Shore Fire Department was formed, each of the seven communities that actually um, participated in that are saving at least in 2014, an average of $400,000 per community. So there's reason enough there to, to at least uh, approach this with open eyes and see what we can learn as the Wisconsin Policy Forum starts to uh, undertake its study. But as Will said, there are a number of unique factors for our particular village um, police department in particular that I, I have some reticence about. You know. As I said, Chief Whitaker really does seem like he's got a very forward thinking approach, um, wants to make sure diversity and inclusiveness training is a part of what his police officers are doing. As Anna said, de-escalatory practices are something that he does. They take a very holistic approach to wellness checks. The bats in the attic are something that we want them to do. Those sorts of the bandwidth for that sort of interactivity and the community, community guardianship um, model of policing, I worry that that'll go away with this sort of consolidation. Thank you. And Anna. Yeah, um, you know, North Shore Fire, North Shore Health, that works. Um, but I don't believe our police needs to be consolidated with another uh, municipality. You know, I think our taxes are high enough to have top-notch services and have things work really well and be the best they can possibly be. Um, all I hear right now is like shutting down our library and joining North Shore Library System. Like we would never want to do that. So I think I would keep things mostly the same. Um, and yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now we have um, 60 seconds for each candidate's closing remarks. And we'll begin with Jay. Well, I wanted to start by thanking um, our moderators for this evening and for all of the residents for taking time out of uh, your schedule to be with us. My wife is on a business trip and I'm solo parenting tonight. So the fact that my kids haven't made a ruckus over the last hour means that tonight is already a win. Um, but if you're a parent like me, maybe you've wondered as Will echoed in the opening, are we passing on a better world to our families? And I think it's easy to feel pessimistic about that lately, but maybe one way out of that potential cynicism is to scale down. Maybe we can't fix the world, but we can make the village better. I'm not running for village trustee because I fantasized about a side hustle in public service. I'm running because I want my kids to be able to be seen as people, not labels. I want them to be able to walk to amenities for entertainment. And I want them to experience the Bay as a more inclusive and diverse place to live. So I hope you'll vote for me for Village Trustee on April 5th. I'm excited to get to work for my family and yours. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, your closing statement. As I said before, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here tonight. I hope I have demonstrated the ways that I can be open with residents 
be your connection to Village Hall, take initiative, be inclusive, be involved, and get things done to make and keep Whitefish Bay a great place to live. Let's be honest, the other candidates and I pretty much want the same things for Whitefish Bay. The question is, who can make it happen? Who has the experience? Who is showing up? I hope I've demonstrated that I'm the one already attending board meetings and volunteering with our local groups. You can rest assured that I'm not all talk and that I'm already out taking action. I'm excited that this is Whitefish Bay's opportunity to elect another woman to the board and actually have equal representation of men and women. Once again, feel free to contact me at voteannacasper.com. Have a good night, and I truly value your vote. Thank you, and Will. All right, well, first off, thanks again to the hosts. Thank you for everyone who's uh, helping make this run on, on uh, Zoom. As we all know, that can get a little dicey. Uh, and thanks to everyone who's listening in tonight. Um, I chose to run for village board because when I moved here with my wife, we uh, moved here, like I think most people do, to start a family. And um, I'm going to become a father on June 1st, which is uh, uh, the most exciting thing in my world. And when I think about all the things around the village that are great, I'm so excited for my future daughter to get to experience them. But there's also so many things that I want to improve for her and for everyone else. And, and you know, like Jay said, we can't fix the world. Um, but we can think globally and we can act locally and we can improve this place around us and we can make decisions that over the next 5, 10, 20 years will really improve uh, life and make Whitefish Bay much more accessible to so many more people. Um, so yeah, I hope to have your support on April 5th and uh, I hope you'll join all of us in working to make Whitefish Bay a much better place than we found it. Thank you. So that concludes the Whitefish Bay Village Board Candidate Forum. We will move on to the School Board Forum in a few minutes. On behalf of Bay Bridge and the League of Women Voters of Milwaukee County, thank you to the community for your questions, and thank you to our candidates for participating in the forum and running for a position on the Whitefish Bay Village Board. Thank you to each of you, Jay Balachandran, Anna Casper, and Will Olson. You can view a recording of this event on the Bay Bridge YouTube channel and on vote411.org. And that's vote the numbers 411.org. As a reminder, the election will be held April 5th. Information on voting and elections can be found at vote411.org, the League of Women Voters of Milwaukee County website, and at myvote.wi.gov. Please visit the vote411.org website to view your sample ballot, information on your candidates, and a detailed question and answer session. Uh, we will now take a short break and return with the Whitefish Bay School Board Forum at about 8.05. See you soon. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>